All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for uh, joining us this morning. It's uh, great to be uh, back here at the University of Toronto. I actually took some uh, courses here throughout last year uh, before I started my current master's program. So I see this as a sort of homecoming uh, for myself. I actually took courses right in this building. Um, but today uh, I will be speaking to you about the subject of epistemology. Uh, epistemology deals with questions such as what is the nature of knowledge? What are the objects of knowledge? What's the relationship between the knower and the known? And I'll be looking at these questions uh, in the thought of an 11th century Ismaili Muslim thinker whose name was Nasser Khusru. Uh, for those of us who are not familiar with Nasser Khusru, this is just a, sort of a timeline where you see Nasser Khusru is uh, one of a series of Ismaili Muslim thinkers who themselves were contemporary with the Fatimid dynasty, which was established by the Ismaili Imams in the 10th century. As for Nasser Khusru himself, um, he did serve as in the court of uh, such dynasties, such as uh, the Saljuks. However, he says that when he was around 42 years old, he experienced a sort of, uh, a, sort of a spiritual crisis, uh, which led him to eventually embrace the Ismaili faith. He went to Cairo, he received a sort of, uh, a sort of initiation into the Ismaili faith in Cairo and when he left Cairo he was appointed as the Hujat, sort of like a spiritual representative of the Ismaili Imam of his time. And uh, he served as the Hujat in Khorasan, however he was banished from Khorasan so he sought refuge in what is today known as Badakhshan. Nasser Khusru's thought actually incorporates elements of some of his predecessors such as his teacher Shirazi, uh, his predecessor Sijistani, and some have argued even the uh, Ikhwan al-Safa. What is important for us today is that when we talk about Nasser Khusru's thought, we're not just talking about something in the medieval past, but rather Nasser Khusru's work and his poetry, he is one of the most premier uh, Persian poets in history, his poetry and his work gave rise to what could be called a living Ismaili tradition of devotion and practice, a tradition that subsists to the current day, especially amongst communities in uh, Central Asia, where Nasser Khusru's works continue to be read, uh, you could say, religiously. So as for my particular study, um, why did I embark on this? And it actually happened where I was reading a couple of works of Nasser Khusru, and I came across an instant where Nasser Khusru apparently gives us two different definitions of knowledge, as you can see here. Uh, I also found, and I've just listed here, the major secondary studies of Nasser Khusru's thought aspects of it in English tend to only look at one of these definitions, and I've just listed the secondary studies here. So, my study uh, this is sort of like a preliminary study to basically see, well, you know, what is exactly going on here when we have two different definitions of knowledge. And um, my study so far has found that this is actually because Nasser Khusru's epistemology features two different modes of knowing. Uh, the first mode of knowing is what I call intellectual perceptual knowledge in which the knower has a direct apprehension of the objects of knowledge and the second kind of knowledge is what I call acquired conceptual knowledge in which the knower has only a representation of the objects of knowledge. What is important is that I found that Nasser Khusru's epistemology appears to integrate these two types of knowing together in so as sort of complementary phases of the human uh, knowing experience. So to begin um, before we get, in, we explore these ideas of knowledge in some depth, we should perhaps talk a little bit about, well, what is the known, right? What are the objects of knowledge? So, Nazar Khusru has pointed out that the Arabic word for world, alam, and the Arabic word for knowledge, ilm, share the same Arabic root, the three-letter root. And he concludes, therefore, that the world as such is filled with knowledge, and every, the world and everything in the world uh, they, these are the objects of knowledge. So then, he has a theory, his cosmology has a theory of three worlds. Um, the first world is what he calls the spiritual world, which consists of a spiritual hierarchy consisting of the universal intellect and the universal soul that some of the Neoplatonic thinkers had talked about, as well as an archangelical hierarchy. 
Then there's the physical world, which consists of, you know, the world of matter, the everyday world of the senses as we see it. And then there's also in his thought what he calls the third world. In a sense, it's an intermediary world of beings that participate in the spiritual and the physical. And that's essentially the world of human beings made of body and soul. But specifically, this third world, which he calls the world of faith, consists of certain spiritually exalted human beings. In his views, those are the prophets, the successors of the prophets, the imams who succeed them, as well as certain representatives of the imam within the Ismaili community, which are called the gates and the proofs. So that's his ontology and his cosmology. He also um, tells us that all these worlds are encompassed and actually caused by the command or word of God. So that's the source of this whole thing. Uh, Nasser Khosru also divides the objects of knowledge, so what is knowable, into sensibles and intelligibles. Sensibles, whatever can be immediately known through the senses. Intelligibles, whatever cannot be immediately known by the senses. And it's interesting because intelligibles include, you could say, discursive types of knowledge, like scientific knowledge, knowledge about you know how the world works, philosophy, theology. Intelligibles also include everything in the spiritual world, including the human soul. So those are the objects of knowledge. And having talked about that, we can now talk about the first concept or the first definition of knowledge that Nasser Khosru gives. And uh, that is given in one of his works known as the Wajideen, the face of religion. He begins chapter 3 by telling us that knowledge means to perceive things as they are. And that which perceives things as they are is the intellect. Now this term that he uses to talk about perception gives us, the, it has a sort of meaning as the direct finding or the direct grasping of things by the intellect. So it is a, it is a way in which the knower, the intellect, knows the object of knowledge directly without mediation. Uh, what's also important about this is that Nasser Khosru identifies pure knowledge, so you could say the highest form of knowledge, with the word or command of God. So he tells us here that that which perceives things as they are is the intellect. So it would help us if we spend a little bit of time looking at what is Nasser Khosru's understanding of intellect. How does this intellect perceive? So in his thought, we find that intellect exists in two forms. There's a universal intellect, and then there's an individual or particular intellect uh, that is in human beings. For him, the universal intellect is the first, orig or first originated being from God's command. And in one sense, he tells us that the universal intellect and the command of God, which is pure knowledge, existentially they are one. Uh, conceptually they are two. For example, black and blackness, existentially they are the same thing you always find them together. It's only conceptually that black and blackness are separate. So similarly, the intellect and the command of God are existentially one. Uh, why is this relevant to knowledge? Well, Nasser Khosru writes that the intellect, the universal intellect, only perceives its own essence. That's all it knows. And, and this is just a quote where, where he tells us this. So in his words, the universal intellect is both the intellect and the intellector. We may ask then, if, if this is the case, in what sense does the universal intellect perceive things as they are? Things in the plural. That's answered, I guess, when Nasser Khosru defines the universal intellect as a luminous substance which contains the forms of all things. What then are forms? So, you know, Nasser Khosru is appealing to a type of, uh, a type of worldview that was characteristic to his time which saw all objects being composed of matter and form. Form here, however, is not the way something simply looks. It's very easy to think of form as just the shape of a thing, but form, according to Nasser Khosru, is the spiritual or intellectual essence of a thing by which it is ultimately known. Uh, that's how he talks about form in this sense. So what we can conclude from this so far is that the universal intellect perceives things as they are by perceiving the forms of all things in itself. 
So that's how the first definition of knowledge works with regard to the universal intellect. And what we can also see from this idea is that for the universal intellect, the knower and the known are one. Right? The intellect and the intelligible are essentially one. So then we may ask, okay, how does knowledge or perception work for the individual intellects? The intellect that is in every human being. So, Nasir Khusru does believe that every human being has an individual intellect, but as we will see in a few slides, uh, it's not equally actualized in people. But insofar as every human being has an intellect, Nasir Khusru defines that individual intellect in this quote that you see here. What I will point out is that that intellect is defined as a substance by which people perceive things. Uh, that matches that first definition of knowledge that I mentioned two slides ago. So he stresses at least three times in this passage, Nasser Khusru is emphasizing that even the human individual intellect perceives things as they are. So we may ask, well, what does it mean to perceive in this sense? Fortunately, in the same text, Nasser Khusru uh, has a chapter on perception. He discusses how perception works, the relationship between a perceiver and what he perceives, and so on. At the end of that chapter on perception, Nasser Khusru concludes that the perceiver becomes the object of perception through his act of perception. So what this is telling us, if, if we look at what he says here, and we keep in mind his notion of form is that by which something is known, we are basically seeing that the individual intellect perceives the form or the forms of things, and in doing so, in that perception it becomes one with those forms. So that's very interesting because it seems that this theory of intellectual perception, even on the part of a human being, the perceiver and the perceived are in union. Although I admit Nasser Khusru does not argue a whole case for the union of the perceiver and the perceived like many later philosophers do. What's also should be pointed out is that he does write in another text that when the individual intellect grasps an object of intellection, it actualizes seven eternal, seven attributes from the universal intellect. So um, we can now move to the second definition of knowledge. This is the first mode of knowledge, knowledge as perception. So now let's talk about the second definition of knowledge. Interestingly, um, he gives this second definition of knowledge in the same text that I quoted on the previous slide. In that text, he defines knowledge, ilm, as the concept of a thing as it is. And, of course, this term, tasawur, has a long history in Arabic logic. Here it does not appear to be used in, in that logical sense, but rather tasawur in the sense of conception or representation. In the same text, Nasir Khusru tells us that this conceptual kind of knowledge is the trace of intellect. And he tells us that it's acquired knowledge. And he gives many examples of conceptual knowledge that I've listed here. How is it acquired? It is acquired through sense perception. So in that same text, Nasser Khusru talks about sense perception. For here, he's talking about the power of sight. And at the end of sense perception, he describes how the soul, through the intermediary of some sense power, recognizes what, it's, what is perceived and conceptualizes. And you see the, the same uh, language being used. And just to make it clear for you, this is a quick summary of how um, Per sense perception leads to conceptual knowledge in Nasser Khusru's thought. So you have a physical object. One of the uh, faculties of the, of the soul, like sight or hearing, perceives it. It picks up sensory forms. Those sensory forms are sent to an internal faculty called estimation. Estimation sends it to another faculty. These are called faculties of the soul. Reflection. Reflection sends it to imagination. Imagination abstracts certain things and stores it in memory. So what we see is that a concept of a thing is based on this sense perception. And essentially, conceptual knowledge, according to Nasser Khusru, is telling us about the qualities of a thing. It's telling us about a thing as opposed to the essence of the thing. So what's also interesting is Nasser Khusru contrasts 
conceptual knowledge with another kind of knowing which he calls marifa. Now those who have studied Sufism or Sufi thought must be quite familiar with this term. He tells us in another text that the difference between marifa and ilm in a conceptual sense is that knowledge, conceptual knowledge is acquired and not innate while marifa is innate but not acquired. What's also very interesting about this notion of marifa is that what Nasa Kursu tells us here. He says that the higher spiritual world is intuitively recognized. That is, it is known through marifa and not known conceptually. While the physical world is conceptually known. That's very significant because you see there's a sort of a epistemological boundary between th these, these types of knowing have certain limits. Now, in my paper, although this is just a slide presentation summarizing it, I do argue that intellectual perception, as previously discussed, actually coincides with marifa. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. I can't get into the details now, but he basically discusses these things, dis he discusses these things in very much the same way. So, we may ask, we've talked about these two different kinds of knowledge, do they come together? And if so, how do they come together? Well, I think they do come together when one looks at how Nasa Kursu talks about the evolution of human intellect. So for him, human beings possess, at the very least, a intellect in a potential state, what he calls an innate intellect. The innate intellect is not able to perceive things as they are in, in a full way, rather it, it, on, it can only accept knowledge from outside of itself. Then he talks about how there's a level of intell intellect called the acquired intellect. The acquired intellect, according to Nasa Kusru, receives continuous inspiration from the universal intellect. This is where his epistemology takes on a religious dimension. Nasa Kusru believes that it's the role of the prophets and the imams and in his time the Ismaili teaching hierarchy known as the Dawa. He believes it's their, it's their role to actualize the human intellect through a program of knowledge and action. That program includes the book, the scripture, the sharia, the tahwil, esoteric interpretation, as well as tawhid. Um, he also writes that the acquired intellect, that's intellect at its highest level, is acquired through instruction. So instruction refers to a whole set of disciplines and subjects that one would learn in the uh, Ismaili faith of his time. What this is all telling us, I believe, is that this journey of intellectual actualization actually requires the acquisition of what we've previously defined as conceptual knowledge. And when the intellect, through knowledge, conceptual knowledge and action, has reached the state of a divinely inspired intellect, or an acquired intellect, then it perceives intelligibles without the aid of the senses. So thus, it appears to me that these two kinds of knowledge that I've discussed today, conceptual knowledge and perceptual knowledge, are on a kind of continuum with respect to the evolution of the human intellect. So, um, to conclude then, you know, we, we've talked a, a lot about knowledge today and the different kinds of knowledge. And I think it's easy to think that sometimes, you know, no, especially in the modern times, the knowledge is, t tends to be acquired sometimes for its own sake. In Nasser Khosrow's view, the acquisition of knowledge tends to have cosmic significance. So according to him and his cosmology that many of the Ismaili thinkers before him had talked about, the creation of the different worlds occurred through the universal soul. The universal soul created the physical world and human beings because the universal soul wanted to actualize its own perfection and return to the universal intellect. Human beings play a critical role in this and thus Nasa Khosrow writes that the soul that leaves the world with knowledge will be compatible with the universal soul. So knowledge is being acquired by human beings so human beings can return to the universal soul and so then the universal soul can return to the universal intellect. And so he writes at the end of this passage uh, talking about knowledge and specifically the knowledge of Tawheed, knowledge of the oneness of God with respect to all of existence.
when they become wise by attaining this great knowledge, the universal soul will ameliorate its defect through them, and thus the universal soul, through the knowledge of human beings, will attain to perfection. Thank you very much.